liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the road, the rolling sea everyone. What a befitting song for this last day of Black History Month. I'm sure you enjoyed uh, the musical selection, but I want to say good evening once again to everyone. I am Dr. Jennifer Adebanjo, and I serve as chair of the History and Political Science Departments here at Fisk University. Uh, tonight is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. I know that I speak for Professors James Quirin, Linda Wynn, Antoine Leach and Patrick Rossico, when I say that we are very happy that you've decided to join us here this evening. Tonight marks the 25th year of this annual gathering. It is also the second year that we are holding this event under its newly designated name, the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series. This event formerly known as the Pearson Lecture Series was originally named to honor Dr. William Pearson Dr. Pearson served as chair of the history department for 15 years and held the prestigious distinction of a McKnight scholar in American history. In 2021, the members of the department unanimously voted and decided to rename the Pearson Lecture Series, the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series to likewise honor the memory of our beloved Dr. Revis L. Mitchell who served as chair of history for 14 years and as a dean of the School of Humanities and Behavioral Social Sciences for 13 years. This campus-wide community event was and is the brainchild of the late Dr. Revis L. Mitchell. It was instituted as an annual forum to provide primary research information on Fisk University. And so that's why we are here tonight in this forum I know you're in for a treat tonight. Our feature lecturer, lecturer for this evening is the newest member of our department and he is none other than the very capable Dr. Patrick Rossico. We also have a musical selection that I'm sure you will be uh, greatly entertained by on this evening also. So I'm certain that you will be intellectually stimulated this evening, enlightened, inspired and entertained. Once again, welcome and we thank you for joining us here this evening. We will now have our invocation with Reverend Dr. Jason Curry. And after, immediately after him, we would turn everything over into the hands of our moderator for the evening, who is none other than Dr. James Quirin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adabanjo. Let us pray. For those who are committed to the task of educating this generation as well as those yet to come, we pause to say thank you for another opportunity, indeed a privilege that it is to work together with those who still see education as a necessary factor in the equation for a better life. We pause and we say thank you. For those who still recognize that our destiny is inextricably connected to our willingness to help others in need wherever and however we may find them, we say thank you. From the bottom of our hearts to the depths of our souls, we give thanks to you. This evening, oh God, we ask your blessings upon this assembly of our Fisk family. We thank you for allowing us to be present and to participate in the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series. And we thank you for another opportunity to recognize your presence and your goodness amongst us. Bless us, O oh God, keep us, O oh God, guide us and empower us, but most importantly, abide with us till we meet again, amen. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Well, I have the honor or the privilege or the duty of uh, being the moderator this evening. I am James Quirin, Professor of History. <clears throat> um, 
We are honoring two of our colleagues who have fallen. And we're also, of course, honoring Fisk in terms of uh, new knowledge about Fisk presented by our presenter. So I have the um, honor to start the evening as the person giving remembrances of Bill Pearson. William Dillon Pearson <clears throat> was a stalwart member of this department for close to 20 years. On December 30th, about three o'clock in the afternoon, according to the records in 1996, <clears throat> Bill Pearson, his wife Charlotte, and their daughter Catherine, known as Katie, were on their way back from Houston, having visited Charlotte's parents in Houston, where they went almost every year for Christmas. Bill was uh, careful. He was driving on December 30th instead of New Year's Eve. Um, nevertheless, tragedy befell them, and a terrible traffic accident occurred in which all three members of the Pearson family died, Bill Pearson, Charlotte, and Katie. Charlotte was on the staff of the library at uh, Vanderbilt. <clears throat> Katie was an excellent student at the uh, <clears throat> Hume Fogg Academic Magnet School downtown. And it was, it was just a loss. It's still hard to uh, fathom it. He was 54 years old and at the peak of his academic career. So Bill was born in a suburb of Chicago, Highland Park along with two brothers and a sister. He graduated from Grinnell College in Iowa, a BA, and went on to master's degrees at Indiana University. He got, in fact, two master's degrees, which uh, characterize his career. One was in folklore, the other one was in history. So throughout his career, he used folklore <clears throat> as a way to understand the life of the people that he was trying to study. He felt that was the uh, internal sort of source that gives better uh, information than simply reading something that somebody else wrote that, that wasn't part of, the, of that group. So during graduate school and after he taught at Purdue University briefly at Springfield College in Massachusetts and at Texas Tech before coming to Fisk in 1977. Uh, despite the teaching load that we all have at Fisk and the service load that we also have, Bill was able to produce three excellent books and a number of articles and 450 abstracts of articles. He uh, received many journals and he abstracted the articles, which were then published uh, separately as abstracts so people could read the abstracts if they couldn't have time to read all the whole article. <laughs> uh, he in fact focused in his writing and in his research and in his teaching on trying to make people present something concisely and precisely. He worked extremely hard in his writing, writing and rewriting. So his books, his books are not overly long, but you know, around 150 plus pages to 200 pages, but they're extremely well-researched and well-written. So the three books, his first one was Black Yankees, subtitle, The Development of an Afro-American Subculture in 18th Century New England. So it dealt with African-American culture and history <clears throat> in the New England part of the United States. That was his uh, dissertation revised and published as a book dissertation 1975 uh, his book came out first in 1988 so it took a few years <laughs> that's uh, that's what happens sometimes his second book is an astounding innovative original book called black legacy so this fits into the uh, category of people who have studied the african influence on african-american culture and more broadly american culture and history and indeed, that was his focus throughout his career. Black Legacy, America's Hidden Heritage. I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. His third book, which was published the year that he died, <clears throat> From Africa to America. So this is a concise history of 
the beginning of African American culture in the United States from the time of the beginning, pre slavery, actually, he talked about uh, other <clears throat> European explorers who came to the Americas, they often had uh, black uh, workers with them. Before 1619, the famous or infamous year of slavery in the United States. So, Black, uh, leg, uh, the From Africa to America book um, is a concise, again, precise investigation of early African American history. He was also the author of numerous articles in publications such as the Journal of American Folklore, the Journal of Negro History, now the Journal of African American History, Research in African Literatures, the Indiana Magazine of History, and among others. He also wrote several book reviews published in the Journal of American History, the Journal of Southern History, New England Quarterly, and the Journal of the Early Republic. His abstracts appeared his abstracts appeared in uh, ABC Clio, uh, and the articles were from African Economic History, Liberian Studies Journal, the Journal of American Folklore, and America, History and Life, and Historical Abstracts. So this combination illustrates his interest, folklore, history, and all used in the service of uh, studying African Americans. He was a member of many organizations, gave papers at many organizations. He and Ravis Mitchell often went together to conferences and um, <clears throat> gave papers. So as seen from his work and his publications, Bill's uh, interests were wide ranging. And he, uh, but he focused mainly on the earliest period, the colonial period in American history. What he was, however, was very fearless in following research wherever it might lead and whatever conclusions he might come up with. Uh, he was original and he had he worked hard on his clarity of expression. He drew on sources and insights, as I've said, from folklore, popular culture, religion and magic, cooking, medicine, music, language, or whatever else he could find. <laughs> so he, he was looking for sources to better understand African-American history and culture um, <clears throat> and it worked very hard to do that. Uh, he said in one of his books shortly before his death, my work, my work takes Africa seriously as one of the sources of our national culture. And I have argued that American culture cannot, cannot be understood without serious attention to its African heritage. More concisely, in his last book, From Africa to America, he had this uh, very strong, insightful statement. <clears throat> He's dealing with the period of slavery and the Middle Passage and so on. Uh, he says, historians have com commonly given far too much honor to the founding fathers who were in reality traitors to the principles of freedom and missed altogether the greater heroism of those black men and women who were the true, truer vanguard of liberty. He's discussing how people resisted slavery, resisted the slave trade, etc. Another uh, short quotation. All right, one more quotation. Um, this is from his book, Black Legacy. Much of what made the Southern way of life distinctly, distinctive and of which Southern whites remain most proud, their hospitality and manners, their code of honor and aristocratic style, their gregariousness, their shaded front porches, their cooking, music, speech, and while we are at it, probably even their baton twirling loose body posture and rebel yell is at least partly due to African-American influence. All well, those two things sum up many things that he uh, that he said. During his 20 years at Fisk, he was also a he was a leading member of the faculty. He served as chair of the Department of History, as Dr. Adabanjo had mentioned. He served twice as a chair of the faculty assembly on numerous committees, including being chair of the Promotion and Tenure Committee. He wrote uh, early bylaws for the uh, 
faculty assembly. In fact, the reason that we have a chair and a chair designate for the coming year is because of Bill's argument that people needed to have some uh, introduction to being chair of the faculty assembly. He also was a principal author of an early version of the faculty handbook, which has been revised since as well. So these academic and administrative contributions were made while teaching this uh, regular load that we have at Fisk. One of the honors he cherished most was the way his teaching was ex accepted and uh, praised by the students. During his career as a teacher, he, he prided himself on dealing with all students in a, an equitable and uh, stimulating approach and inspired many to go on to graduate or professional school, as we all have been trying to do during the years we've been here. Uh, Bill Pearson recruited myself, Revis Mitchell, Linda Wynn, to be faculty members in history during the time that he was chair. In his actions in, in the faculty, if he saw a problem, he was not slow to respond to it. He would jump in and try to find a solution. Uh, that included additions to the curriculum. For example, the course we used to have called African American Heritage. Uh, he devoted long hours to teaching and studying for <clears throat> being able to teach the core curriculum course, The World and Its Peoples. And he produced two volumes of notes relating to that teaching effort. So although it's been many years since that event, we still miss him, his family, his friends, his colleagues, former students, miss his uh, presence. <clears throat> and definitely we have a lot to learn from his life and career. Good evening and welcome to the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series. Before I begin, let me congratulate Sierra Poole and Paul uh, on being selected as the Courier Scholars for the academic year of 2021-22. Uh, I had both of you as freshmen and have watched your matric your maturity as you matriculated through the university. And just let me say how proud I am of you and your accomplishments. My task for this evening is to uh, reflect on the life of Dr. Rivers Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell was the past Dean and also chair of the history department during his tenure at Fisk University. Uh, when one thinks of Dr. Mitchell, uh, I think of him as a friend and colleague. Uh, he was an elucidator, especially in a meeting setting. Uh, he always expounded upon a story that some in attendance may not have known. Uh, and he would almost make you feel like you were actually in the period about which he was speaking. Dr. Ne Mitchell never missed an opportunity to encourage students, faculty, staff, or friends. When offering words of encouragement, he would often say, uh, get out of your own way. That was one of his favorite exhortations. Dr. Mitchell was not only accessible to students, uh, colleagues and fellow administrators at this, but he was also very accessible to the city of Nashville, the state of Tennessee, and across the nation. He gave of his service and his talent uh, in various capacities that he served in, including being the chair of the Metropolitan Historical Commission, the Tennessee Historical Commission, the State Review Board, and the Tennessee Historical Society, just to name a few. As an administrator, colleague, uh, collaborator, faculty member, scholar, and public servant, he was valued for his ability to build consensus across the spectrum. Uh, it is difficult to believe that he has 
he joined the ancestors almost two years ago. And when I go to various meetings in the city or across the state, uh, there have been many, many people uh, who have said to me how they miss Dr. Mitchell and his collaboration, uh, especially if it's something that is dealing with African-American uh, history in the city or the state. Also, uh, one day this week, a former student came by uh, and what the student said was that he remembered Dr. Mitchell and myself and that we were in part responsible for helping him to matriculate through the university. And he wanted me to know how much he appreciated uh, the both of us for helping to him to become what he has become. Uh, Dr. Mitchell served on the faculty of Fisk University uh, beginning in 1980 uh, at, to June of 1920. Uh, he was some of the positions he held, including being chair of the department and of the school or dean of the school was uh, director of institutional advancement he was executive assistant to Dr. Henry Partner, uh, president of the university. Uh, he held adjunct professorships uh, across the city and uh, in some cases across the, the nation. Uh, as an academician, Dr. Mitchell imparted the tools of, of nurturing and mentorship necessary for students to excel in their educational pursuits and in life. He and his colleagues in the Department of History produced over 50 students who went, who went on to earn their PhDs in history. Uh, Dr. Mitchell served as a consultant for the PBS film entitled The American Experience that highlighted the Fist Jubilee Singers. Mitchell also served as a consultant for Spark Media in Washington, D.C. for the documentary, Partners of the Heart, which chronicles uh, the life of Dr. Vivian T. Thomas, a pioneering surgical technician. He also served as, as an on-air consultant for WTVF. Uh, he was a contributor to the Encyclo Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture. Uh, he also Author, uh, the lawyer children make their way. Fisk University since 1866, and it was published in 1985. He generally generously gave of his time uh, to the state of Tennessee and the Metropolitan Historical Commission. But the vineyard that he enjoyed most was that of the academy, and his interactions with the faculty and students many of whom he considered not only colleagues, but friends, a term that he did not use loosely. Uh, one of whom he considered as a friend was Dr. William D. Pearson. Mitchell thoroughly enjoyed honoring the late Dr. William Pearson, who with his entire family was killed in an automobile accident. I believe that date was December the 30th, 1996. It was Dr. Mitchell who hired, it was Dr. Pearson who hired Dr. Mitchell, as well as a number of other members of the Fisk History Department. Uh, Pearson and Mitchell's relationship grew from colleagues to friends who respected each other's accomplishments and contributions in the discipline. With Mitchell's entrance into the public history sphere, to the delight of Pearson, he added a new dimension and visibility to the department. Soon after the demise of Dr. Pearson, uh, Dr. Mitchell and his departmental colleagues instituted the Pearson Lecture Series that focused on primary research about Fisk University. Presenters generally included those affiliated with the faculty or either alumni who had conducted or were conducting research on some aspect of Fisk University. 
Topics from the arts, athletics, history, and the social and physical sciences were among the topics discussed. He beamed with joy when the Theodore S. Courier scholar gave an insightful response to the topic discussed. At the end of the lecture, he would say to his history colleagues, we are a small department, but we, but we do excellent work in preparing our students to enter, compete, and earn their advanced degrees in history from any master's PhD program in the country. It is with some sadness that I go back and reflect on the life of Dr. Mitchell. Not only were we colleagues, but we were lifelong friends and we shared many opportunities throughout the city of Nashville and the state of Tennessee. With all of his personal accomplishments, Dr. Mitchell was foremost a devoted family man and a faithful community servant uh, who led with love. It is my honor to give this brief biographical sketch of the late Dr. Revis Lee Mitchell, Jr. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Professor Wynn. <clears throat> we are both sad, saddened by the loss of our two colleagues, one many years ago, one very too much, very recently. Both of them taken from us too early. Uh, we will now have a musical performance by Tori Westbrook, music major class of 2022.
Thank you for that rousing performance. Um, it's now my honor to introduce one of our students, graduating senior, Sierra Poole, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Quirin. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well tonight. Well, I have the ultimate pleasure of introducing our lecturer for tonight's event, Dr. Patrick D. Rossico. Dr. Patrick D. Rossico is an assistant professor here at Fisk University, focusing on the history of modern Britain and empires in India. He received his PhD from the Department of History at Vanderbilt University in 2019. From 2019 to 2021, he was an Andrew W. Mellon Partners for Humanities Education Postdoctoral Fellow at Fisk University. Dr. Rossico has had scholarly articles appear in the Journal for 18th Century Studies and the Historical Journal. He has also contributed articles on the history of the Fisk Jubilee Singers in popular venues in the United States and India. Dr. Rossico's book project, Empire of Circulation examines how the importation of South Asian artworks and antiques was central to British understandings of both India and British national character. And at Fisk, Dr. Rossico teaches courses on modern Asian history, global British empire, and world history. So with that, can we all please give the biggest virtual round of applause for our keynote lecture for tonight's event, Dr. Patrick D. Rossico. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much for that wonderful introduction. Let me get my PowerPoint uh, pulled up here. One second. And okay, and everybody can see all right? Great. So once again, thank you so very much for this wonderful opportunity to share with you this research that I have been able to conduct over the past three or so years. I conducted this research um, mostly when I was a postdoctoral fellow and a, and a bit in my time as an assistant professor here at Fisk University. And so today I am presenting you an original um, bit of information that I uncovered during a period in which, honestly, there was no such thing as the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Rather, the Fisk Jubilee Singers had a couple of incarnations that were that were existed during the 1870s and early 1880s that are much more famous. And so today, I'm look, going to be examining how it is that there was a group of individuals, many of whom had been a part of the Fisk Jubilee Singers in its prior incarnations, and went on to tour the world and to be so successful that Fisk University decided that they themselves would acknowledge this group of initially um, officially dis originally kind of disowned Fisk Jubilee Singers and would also create their own troupe again to revive the official Fisk Jubilee Singers in 1899. So I'm looking at this 17 year period. And so my presentation today is examining this world tour and it's entitled The Fair Criterion of Success, the little known tour of the Fisk Jubilee Singers in late 19th century India. So as I have said, the Fisk Jubilee Singers and their very illustrious history in especially their early years in their first incarnation in the 1870s, it is been, it, it's been a subject of history that has been very, very honored in many, many forms at Fisk University itself in various scholarly and popular articles and even in PBS documentaries and in all kinds of other popular forums. However, this group of Fisk Jubilee singers who toured the United States, who toured Europe for three years and raised enough money and awareness for Fisk University to allow for Fisk to continue to exist during its initial shaky years, this group is so important, but it is the group that grew out of the, um, the dissolution of this initial troupe and its later forms that I really want to examine today because many of the, these folks who were in this initial troupe did approve and did want to be a part of this later tour. And so the period I'm specifically looking at is the 1884 to 1890 period. And during this time period, the Fisk Jubilee Singers at this point headed by 
one of the original fistula singers and a very talented singer and orator by the name of Frederick Loudon. He, along with his manager, his wife, Harriet Loudon, designed a global tour that would promote global awareness for African-American musical forms, especially spirituals, but also would celebrate Fisk University, bring global awareness of Fisk University to many corners of the world, including Australia, New Zealand, Britain, South Asia, and also even parts of China and Japan very briefly. But also, they want to show off this the great degree of refinement and talent that many African persons had or certainly were very uh, capable of achieving, thus trying to dash negative stereotypes and racist ideas, unfortunately, that existed in the United States and elsewhere on Earth. And so, in order to do that, they really intended to negotiate, confront, and challenge many of these ideas of race and class and ethnicity that existed, not just in the United States, but also in their permutations throughout the colonial world, because in many parts of the world, we have Britain colonizing. We have various individuals who are designated as a colonized uh, sector of society and a sector of society that is the colonizer. And so during this time period, we also have a period in which the Fist Jubilee Singers dissolved in 1878. Frederick Loudon and George White, the, initial, the original director of the Fist Jubilee Singers, decided they were not quite done. And so they decided to revive the Fist Jubilee Singers for five years. For five years, they attempted to keep touring under the Fisk name as the Fist Jubilee Singers. But George White gradually became disillusioned with the project. And he, unlike Frederick Loudon, the fellow here on the right, decided that the Fist Jubilee Singers had run their course. He had felt that there really was nothing more that they could do in terms of raising awareness for Fisk or helping to financially support Fisk. And so he resigned, but Loudon didn't agree. And at that point, he stepped up to become co-manager with his wife, Harriet Loudon, who was not a singer, but she was a brilliant uh, logistics expert, we'll say. And she, along with her husband, Frederick, got the, a new coterie of Fist Jubilee singers and departed on a tour in 1848. They toured the, excuse me, 1884, excuse me. And they toured a little bit in the United States before heading over to Britain and Ireland for another tour. When they departed, they were specifically told by President Cravath of Fisk University that Fisk did not support them. And they accused them of being a fraudulent organization in the sense of being one of the many groups that all claimed to feed the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Cravath was not happy about this. President Cravath said that I really regard Loudon's troop as just the Loudon's Jubilee Singers and as a troop that like many others are just claiming that they are associated with Fisk. But unlike some of those troops, Frederick Loudon really, really did want to support Fisk and the money he raised and the speeches he delivered in each of his concerts continue to be supportive of Fisk University. And so for two years, the troop circulated parts of Britain and Ireland, in some cases meeting with great success and other cases finding that not many people were showing up for their concerts. But after two years, of initially mixed reviews, followed by some concerts where they received great, great uh, encomium, they decided that they should go on the next leg of the tour. And so in 1886, they decided they would leave for what were known as the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand. They planned after that to also eventually make their way to parts of Asia. So you can see now in this map I have constructed, April 1884, crossing the Atlantic, spending two years in Britain before traveling down the Atlantic, through the Mediterranean, going then through the Suez Canal and down through the Red Sea, and then over to Australia. And I'll briefly bring up their time in Australia, because after being in Australia for about three and a half years, where they met with enormous success, they began their homeward bound tour, as they dubbed it, and they headed northward initially up to Ceylon, today known as Sri Lanka, up to Calcutta in Bengal, and then across Northern India, stopping in parts of 
of northern India and then making their way through other parts of India before stopping in Burma and stopping briefly in China and Japan. And so as you can see, they did not just stay, as my timeline shows, in, in Australia during the three and a half years. They also went to New Zealand on two separate tours where they also met with great success. Interestingly, during these tours, they loved being in Australia and New Zealand so much that they actually had to recruit new members because some individuals even quit the Jubilee Singers and stayed in Australia and New Zealand. One fellow later became actually an important member of New Zealand's parliament after reti retiring from the Fist Jubilee Singers, stayed in New Zealand. But nevertheless, after these wonderfully successful tours, they then left for India, where they were initially very worried that their success could be not insured. They could have really not met with much success, but they did. And so they were in Calcutta for only about three weeks. Then they sailed, or excuse me, they traveled by train across uh, Northern India, stopping in the um, state of Uttar Pradesh, formed in Lucknow, Kanpur, and Agra, before then making their way over to the West Coast and going to Bombay, sailing down the coast, stopping in the Southern tip of India in Madras, and then going over to Rangoon in modern day Myanmar, then known as Burma, before then spending two months traveling over to East Asia before then heading back home and arriving in San Francisco. So once again, it's this leg of the tour that I'll now talk about once they are down in Australia. And also, I just want to say, I just found this photo of the singers not long after their return from South Asia in an archive in New Zealand. So good to have more and more group photos. But nevertheless, during this time period, the singers consisted of Georgie Gibbons and Maggie Wilson as contraltos, Maggie Carnes, Belle Gibbons, and Matty Lawrence, and Patty Malone as sopranos, Robert Bradford Williams, and John Lane as tenors, Robert Bradford Williams being an individual who stayed in New Zealand, Frederick Loudon and Orpheus McAdoo were basso. Orpheus McAdoo actually ended up retiring as well and stayed in Australia. And then Leota Henson, who was Frederick and Harriet Loudon's niece. She was pianist. And she kept a lot of interesting information, scrapbooks, letters. Her desire to document this tour as much as possible is actually what made my entire presentation and indeed my, all my research possible. Along with the correspondence of one other unlikely source that I will talk about in a bit. But nevertheless, once in Australia in 1886, the Fist Jubilee Singers traveled back and forth between Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Adelaide when they were not on their two tours, each of which lasted about six months in New Zealand in 1886 to 1887 and in 1888 to 1889 in New Zealand. When they, re when they first arrived in Australia, Frederick Loudon noted just how great of a reception they received. In fact, he said in one letter, we cannot forget the cordial welcome we received. Numerous social gatherings were arranged by leading citizens of Melbourne, by members of parliament and their wives, and by leading merchants, until finally the social courtesies culminated in a grand reception and private concert at the Grand Hotel. You can see the Grand Hotel here on the right, where the Fist Jubilee Singer stayed and performed. One other notable um, concert that they gave, well, several notable concerts, I should say, but one in particular that Frederick Loudon reflected upon was the June 1886 concert they gave in Melbourne's town hall. You can see here their organ room where they performed. He said that they gave our first concert. We had rented the town hall seating 3,200 and the hall was packed almost to suffocation as it was also on the 25 succeeding nights. We eclipsed all records of concert companies during our stay in Melbourne, for we gave 80 successful concerts during this visit to Melbourne. And so there is a bit of ephemera and materials from their tours that still exist in archives in Australia. But fortunately, this wonderful program that exists here in FIS Special Collections says a little bit not only about how they advertised their performances, but also who was in the group. And on this side, the songs that they sang. So we have a document of the songs they sang. But I also should mention that Frederick Loudon tended to also give a number of speeches in between these different songs. 
And in doing so, he often sang the praises, no pun intended, sang the praises of this university and of the history of the, of the Jubilee Singers and how important they had been to the university and their desire to continue to be supportive of the university. And before they departed, however, they ended up still being able to perform before many, many illustrious persons. This was the case throughout their entirety of their time in Australia and New Zealand. And during one of their farewell performances, they received a letter from the mayor of Sydney, who claimed he, quote, had much pleasure in accepting the invitation of the Fist Jubilee Singers to be present at the opening night, Monday the 16th, on their farewell tour at New uh, Cantonary Hall, York Street. And so after a wonderfully successful time in Australia and New Zealand, they then set off to India, where they were much more anxious about how they would do. How would people receive them? How would people perceive them? And ultimately, would people like their music? This was so unknown to them, but they received encouragement to go because they had some friends who had relocated to India over the past few years. First of all, was the, the former governor general of Canada, the person who had been the top colonial officer in Canada, Lord Lansdowne, had been so impressed with them when the Fist Jubilee Singers toured Canada earlier. And when he accepted a new position, when he accepted a new position as head officer in India, the Viceroy of India, hearing that the Fist Jubilee Singers were in Australia, he sent letters to Loudon saying, hey, if you're heading back to the United States, want to stop in India first? I'd love to see you. And so the head top colonial officer personally wrote to the Fist Jubilee Singers, requesting that they stop in India. But in addition to seeing their friend, Lord Lansdowne, they also had one other connection and one that was even much more close to home in India. And this was a former English professor who had actually retired from Fisk University and had moved to India. Her name was Henrietta Matson. She had been one of Fisk's first English professors. She was one of Fisk's first English professors but in 1887, she decided that her time at Fisk had really come to an end because she had received a lot of encouragement from friends and um, other individuals involved in missionary organizations to go relocate to India. And so she moved to India in 1887. And when she got there, she couldn't help but feel as though she missed Fisk so much. She wrote to friends back at home. She wrote to the Spence family, particularly Adam Spence and his family. But also she even wrote letters to the, the uh, Fisk Herald and had her letters published in the Fisk Herald in the years that she was living in India. When she learned that the Fisk Jubilee Singers were in Australia, she also said, if you would wish to stop by India, I will actually be in Calcutta in December uh, in November of 1889 before she was gonna relocate to Burma. And so during her time in India, she not only missed Fisk, but she even kiddingly referred to the students whom she taught as a missionary, these South Asian students as quote unquote, her Fisk students in India or her quote unquote future Fisk students. And so with all of these friends asking the Fisk Jubilee Singers to come to India, they couldn't resist. And so they got a ride aboard the RMS um, Orizaba. And while traveling from Australia up to India, they, in fact, even performed on the ship. They performed on the ship, and they ended up actually getting a very uh, positive reception just from the passengers. But as they approached India, something very unexpected happened. A huge cyclonic storm occurred in the Bay of Bengal, one of the largest that had been seen in some time. And they were very worried that their ship would actually be actually in the line of the storm, or at the very best, that they might be late for their first concert that was booked at the Calcutta Opera House in November of 1889. But they were very fortunate in that they ended up making it to Calcutta in time. They had to get off the ship and almost just literally get their luggage, get the luggage to the hotel and then run to the Opera House just to perform in time. But they made it, they made it. And they were exhausted. They weren't sure what people were gonna think of their music. But as you can see from this advertisement, there was a lot of anticipation for their concert and they did an excellent job. For the next two weeks, they performed at the Opera House, where 
the crowd in Calcutta was known for being very tough, a very, very, at times, identify as being kind of a snooty crowd, very critical crowd, but they did an excellent job and they received almost nothing but praise except for one individual whom Henrietta Matson actually sat next to in the crowd. She identified him as one young Scotsman who was quote unquote full of grouch. Well, can't please them all. But you know, if only one person in the crowd doesn't like it, that's still pretty good. So they performed for two weeks in the opera house. Before then, Henrietta Matson asked them to stay one additional week to perform in a local Methodist church that was run by the famous missionary Bishop Thoburn. And so Bishop Thoburn had them for a week performing each night. And from all accounts, from all newspaper, um, all newspaper reports, they received quite applause. And each time Frederick Loudon informed people of the importance of Fisk University and the importance of the singers. And so after they departed Calcutta, they got a train across Northern India and stopped at three cities in the state of Uttar Pradesh in Northern India. They stopped in Lucknow, Kanpur, and Agra. Each of these cities were very large, large cities. And they only performed for a few nights in each city. But each night, they found that while most of the persons who attended their concerts in Calcutta had been persons uh, who were European, they were delighted that so many South Asian persons wanted to see them. And that, in fact, the majority of the persons there were South Asian persons who had nothing but the highest of praise for them. And so, while mostly English, English language newspapers covered their concerts in Calcutta, the Fist Jubilee Singers got press coverage in a variety of South Asian languages during their subsequent concerts. You can see here the Great Eastern Hotel where the Fist Jubilee Singers stayed here on the right. What was then known as the quote unquote white town of Calcutta. You can see Lucknow where the singers performed for a few nights as well in this image from around 1890. And you can see also this image of, of Kanpur. Also the Memorial Church in Kanpur where they performed. And then Agra. And while performing in Agra, they performed in a large um, concert hall. Each night, they had many South Asian persons compliment them on how exquisite their performances were. And on one of the final nights, an individual walked up to Loudon after he left the stage and said, I would love if actually you would come and visit where I work. And where he worked was this place. He was actually one of the main caretakers of the Taj Mahal. And so this individual gave the singers a tour of the Taj Mahal. And while inside, they were given the grand tour of the entire um, building. In fact, they were allowed to walk up right towards the sarcophagus of the famed Mughal emperor, the famed Indian emperor who was buried there, Shah Jahan. And while there, the singers said, the acoustics in this room are fantastic. The whole place is made out of marble. And so they gave an impromptu concert. They sang many songs and several persons stopped to listen. And generally, the Fist Jubilee Singers thought this was quite an experience. As you can see in this, uh, in this quote from Frederick Loudon, we gather around the sarcophagi and soon the great lofty dome echoes the first Christian song it has ever kept caught up. And that song, the cry of a race akin to those whose dust sleeps in the crypt beneath. As the tones of that beautiful slave song steal away to Jesus, which we had sung before emperors, presidents, kings, and queens, awoke the stillness of that most wonderful of temples. We were so much overcome by the unique circumstances that it was with the utmost difficulty we could sing at all. I've been redeemed and we shall walk through the valley, were sung, and thus closed one of the most remarkable events in the history of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And so, as you can see, there was a lot of attention given to Fisk Jubilee Singers, not just when they were in Uttar Pradesh, but when they then made their way over to Bombay. You can see here the Bombay Gazette, published in Hindi, several accounts of their performances. 
And so I have here a sampling of quotes of the praise they received. Last night, there was again a large audience and the singers was, was again and again loudly applauded. Everyone who has heard of the Fiskui singers and how they went out of the world to get sufficient money to pay off the debt of Fisk University and ensure its permanence. We regret that their stay is so short in Bombay, but express a hope that such an opportunity may again be given us of hearing the talented Fiskui singers who have charmed the ears and hearts of many during the past week. So, if there are any fist to be singers in the crowd, you have an invitation that's been long standing. So here's a scene from Bombay, what the streets would have looked like for the fist to be singers walked down in 1890. And then here is where they performed, at least one of the nights. They performed in a few different venues, but one night they played in the Framji Kaswaji Institute in this building. And then, after leaving, after leaving Bombay, they sailed down the coast and they made their way around the tip of Southern India and then up to a city that was one of the former, what they call presidency cities in India, one of the old colonial cities and known as Madras. So in this city, in the modern day state of Tamil Nadu, we had the singers performing for about a week. And while they were there, they played in Victoria Hall and they played in Memorial Hall and newspapers likewise covered the size of the crowds. They would have actually stayed a little bit longer, but actually they missed a train at one point and missed a couple of their shows. Oh, well. They did very well and often received high praise. Here's Madras in 18. And so after being in Madras, the Fisk Jubilee singers were on their way home, but they heard again from their friend Henrietta Matson, who at this point had crossed the Bay of Bengal and had relocated to Rangoon. And she wrote to the Fistuli singers and said, Bishop Thoburn and I are now located at a different church in Rangoon. Want to stop and visit us in Burma? And so they did. They, at this point, went over to Burma and they met up with their friend Henrietta Matson again and they performed for almost three weeks in Bishop Thoburn's church every single night. But they also sang to many crowds that were not even necessarily in the church. They went to some other areas where they, when they were sightseeing, they met a number of individuals who were also singers. They even went to hear the song of other performers, Burmese singers. But I suppose that's a long story for another lecture. But nevertheless, they did an excellent job. They did an, a bunch of sightseeing when in Burma. They were very impressed with some of the architecture and various other um, important sites they saw throughout the city. And while in Burma, they received a very interesting letter. President Kravath said to the Fistuli singers, even though he had pretty much said he was not pleased with them for existing, back in 1884, he had gotten word of just how, how successful they had been. And he said that he was rethinking his stance on the Fistuli singers. And he told Loudon, actually, it's fine. You may call yourself the Fist to Be Singers again. In fact, when you get back to the States, if you want to come visit us and perform in Fisk's Chapel, that would be fine with us. And so they get, the Fist to Be Singers gave a few more nights performance, packed crowds before then departing. Henrietta Matson, as you can see in her characteristically very easy to read letters, described a concert. The Jubilees have been described concerts, but also described her experiences walking around the city with them. And in one instance, she said, the Jubilees have been here a week and did well. In Bombay, they did remarkably well. Bombay has more life than any Eastern city I have seen. They ought to have stayed longer and were begged to stay longer in Madras where they did so well. But their arrangements were made to move on, on homeward to Singapore from there to Hong Kong. Mr. Loudon hopes to get around to Fisk by commencement. President Cravath has invited them to be present at the great anniversary. And so we see Strand Road in Rangoon in 1890 when the Fisk Jubilee singers were there. And so we have the Fisk Jubilee singers departing, making their way to Singapore where they stayed briefly and performed a few nights. 
they went to Hong Kong and performed at the Royal Theater in Hong Kong. They stopped in Shanghai and Canton, China, where they did very well. However, there was a lot of flooding and other uh, weather issues right around that time in Canton and Shanghai. So unfortunately, the crowds weren't quite what they were expecting, but you know, they did their best. And the, those who were there said it was excellent. They then went on to perform a few nights in Kobe, Japan. And then they, sent, they sailed off from Japan aboard this very ship here on the right, the city of Rio de Janeiro, and made their way to San Francisco. So you can see this was the last leg of their tour, March and April, then heading back and arriving in San Francisco before they then traveled across the United States and made their way to Nashville. And here are now some photos, some photos of the Fisk Jubilee Singers purchased and gifted to Fisk University and are now housed in the Fisk Special Collections. Just a few, there are many of these, but they're fascinating. Here's Bolshevar Road in Bombay. Here is a scene in Bombay. This is actually of a uh, procession of individuals during an Islamic festival. And then also they were interested in, in images of men, women, children, the folks of India and Burma. So a lot of images of persons in the street, stage photos like this one of a Parsi school in Bombay. But these are wonderful, wonderful images. In fact, I don't know if there are any other copies of these photos in existence in any other archives. And so it's wonderful that Fisk Jubilee Singers preserved these and gifted them to Fisk University, where they now sit in Fisk Special Collections. And also, the, as they called it, the Sway Dragon Pagoda in Rangoon, which was a large Buddhist temple, the Shwedagon Pagoda, where the Fisk Jubilee Singers themselves toured and marveled at the wonderful golden architecture of the roof. So I hope I have not gone too over time today. And I'd just like to say many thanks to many persons who helped to make this happen. Because all this material was scattered to the wind. Much of this material still probably exists in archives in India and Australia and New Zealand, but some of this material is here in Fisk Special Collections in Nashville. But also many of the letters I utilized are in the Portage County Library and Archive in Ohio, the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta, Georgia, the Detroit Library Special Collections, and also there are a few images I've used today that are from the British Library. So major thanks to everybody who has helped to make this entire project happen. And I'm sure there are many of you that I have to thank that are not on this list. So thank you everybody who's here today. Thank you very much. Anyway, as you were presenting uh, the singers in India, I recalled to me the story of a young person who was taken as a baby out of Ethiopia and grew up in India and Burma. And, you know, he was there at the same time these singers were there. They obviously didn't cross paths. But anyway, a little anecdote. We now have a uh, response by our other graduating senior, Paul Springer. Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, can everybody hear me? I'd first like to start off by thanking Dr. Rossico um, for his great presentation and a personal antidote. I'm currently taking his modern Asia history class right now. So this served as a great addendum to our class and I'll be attending uh, tomorrow. So thank you for that as well. Um, to start off, I would like to uh, say that this research to me was emblematic of the Fisk History Department. Um, since I've been here, we have been a small collection of students, a really small collection of students. In fact, I didn't even start off uh, my matriculation at this uh, university as a history major. I started off as a psychology major. And by the great uh, recruitment of Dr. Brandon Owens and Professor Linda Wynn, I became a history major quite shortly. Um, and ever since then, I've been exposed to different parts of the country, different students, been able to engage with students from much larger universities. And like the Fisk Jubilee Singers, I've been able to interact with a multitude of different uh, cultures, different students from across the world. And that's all thanks to the Fisk University History Department. Um, and the part that I really deem emblematic is that Although we're very small, we spread our wings very far. Um, ever since I've been here, 
uh, students from this department have engaged with students of, of much larger magnitudes that I've even engaged with. Uh, I've, in fact, this summer, I did an internship with Vanderbilt University and of the cohort of five, the university students that I were, were, was engaging with were from Yale University, Brown University, Duke University and Vanderbilt. And here I am from Small Fish University thinking, okay, I'm from the small school. How do I even, you know, connect with these guys? They are at much larger institutions. And what I found out was that I actually had just as much or even more to offer to that cohort from this small history department. And so like those Jubilee singers, I might be small, we might be small as a university, but we spread very far and our impact is very large. And so I have nobody else to thank but uh, Dr. Queeran, Professor Wynn, Dr. Owens, and my students, my colleagues as well. Sierra, we, we've gone through this together, class of 2022. Um, Cassandra Hanna, who I see who's on this call right now, served as a great mentor to me. And like I said, although we're very small, we're a very close-knit community. Everybody in this history department has contacted me and helped me in some way, shape, or form. And because of that, we are here now. Um, and I think the future is bright for us. Like I said, Dr. Rossico uh, is just, an, his research is an example that we touch every part of the world. We're not just a small African-American experience. Our African-American experience touches the world and is, bigger, is a much bigger part of world history than it gets credit for. So for that, again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Rossico, for your great presentation and Fisk University for offering me such a unique and specific education that connects not only my experience to my heritage, but experience across the world. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. We all appreciate our few, but very uh, intelligent and active and uh, good students that we get. Uh, of whom I'm proud to honor two tonight. So at this uh, meeting every time, every year, we have uh, presented the Courier Award. The Courier Award is named after Theodore Courier, a professor of history at Fisk. Started, he started in the late 1920s <clears throat> when he was about tw uh, in, in his 20s. Uh, one of his first principal and major students was John Hope Franklin. John Hope Franklin came to Fisk in 1931, graduated in 1935. In his memoirs, he refers to Ted Courier quite often. Ted Courier was instrumental in producing <clears throat> the historian that became John Hope Franklin. Uh, so let me just say a couple words about Theodore Courier and then we'll uh, go on to the presentation. Theodore Courier spent 45 years teaching at Fisk. Uh, he came with a master's degree from Harvard, a white man from New England. He never finished his doctorate. He wanted to go teach. And he came to Fisk and taught and stayed 45 years. Um, <clears throat> he had only come a few years before uh, Franklin came. So he was young and enthusiastic. In, in John Hope's uh, memoirs, he refers to the fact that uh, Courier was, in, for many years, the only history professor at Fisk, although there was another one at the time in the, in the 30s, uh, Aruthius uh, A. Taylor. <clears throat> Dr. Taylor did not teach that much. In fact, he never taught John Hope Franklin because he was an administrator as well. Uh, so Ted Courier was his major influence in terms of uh, history. Uh, so he um, formed a close association with uh, Franklin and they became friends and supporters until Courier's death. Well, John Hope Franklin was the one that established the Courier Award and uh, supported it financially for many years. Uh, since that time, it's been supported mainly by the members of the history faculty. And so we are pleased tonight to award this year's Courier Award uh, to two co-recipients, Sierra Poole and Paul Springer. So congratulations to you. Uh, I've been pleased to be a uh, teacher of both of them for many years. 
Sierra came four years ago. I was her advisor from her freshman year. Uh, she has de been determined to go on to, to a career in law and she will certainly excel. She has nearly a 4.0 average for these four years. So she has definitely performed at a high level. Uh, Paul Springer, as he mentioned, was originally a psychology major, but uh, we in our efforts uh, convinced him to change to history. And now he's become an outstanding history major and has applied to several schools already and has been accepted to one and is waiting for here to hear uh, from some others for a master's or a doctorate degree program. So I know that both of them will go on to stellar careers in the areas that they have chosen. So congratulations, congratulations. Uh, the Courier Award has a small financial aspect. It's usually been $500, so split into two this year, be 250 each, which will be awarded to them uh, on their FISC account. So congratulations to you. Congratulations to Dr. Rossico for his excellent presentation. And uh, thank you for everyone for coming tonight. We will have some closing remarks from Dean Shirley Brown. Good evening to everyone. First, let me thank the organizers, the Department of History and Political Science for presenting the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series. I would also like to thank all of the participants on the program, an outstanding event. As you are aware, and many have said, the goal of the Pearson Mitchell Lecture Series is to provide historical research data on Fish University that will empower, enlighten, and enhance our knowledge of this great institution of higher learning. It was very good to hear the biographical sketches of Dr. Pearson and Dr. Mitchell. Special thanks to Dr. Patrick Russico for his inspiring presentation about the tour traveled by the Fish Jubilee singers in India during the late 19th century. I was also very, very impressed with Paul, the student who gave those impactful remarks, very outstanding. I have certainly enjoyed this evening immensely, and I hope you have too. I would like to thank each of you for your participation tonight. Your time is precious, and we do not take it lightly. Your participation has been highly appreciated. So again, thank you. And we will see you next time. Good night. Thank you, Dean Brown. Uh, thank you for those wonderful remarks. And as chair of the department, I just wanna say, give a special thank you to our speaker. That was a dynamic, very interesting and inspiring presentation of the little known history of uh, the Fist Jubilee Singers. Let's give him another hand of applause. It was very, very enlightening, very inspiring. I also want to say congratulations, congratulations again to our Curious Scholars. We are expecting greater things from you and I know you will do your very best to continuously represent Fisk University. I want to give a special thanks to Mr. Tory Westbrook for that musical selection uh, under, the, under the direction of Dr. Paul Kwame. We thank the whole music department for helping us out this evening. Thank you, Dean Brown, for being here. A very, very special thank you to Dr. Brandon Owens, who helped put this together, put this Zoom uh, meeting together tonight. Let's give him a hand of applause. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. Thank you. And to the Department of History and Political Science. So very proud of you and thank you. Thank you for your wonderful work and support. And to you, all of the students who come out tonight and, and uh, some of the faculty members, those that I see here on the Zoom line tonight. So that concludes this evening's program. Uh, I wanna say good night again and stay safe. See some of you tomorrow in class. <laughs>
Let it resound.